you're not good enough at ultrasound, that's not an excuse to punish your patients with radiation. Get out there, ultrasound some hearts, some lungs, some IVCs, let us know how you feel about it. Uh, he's slightly intoxicated, you know, got his wrist pain by, by doing over-aggressive high fives to his buddies. <laughs> Hi, this is Christopher Walken. I've been a big fan of the ultrasound podcast for some time now, so I was very excited to hear the interception episode. But where was Andy? I need some Andy slows. Regards. I promise you slow, so dang it, here he is. Slows on interception. Before we start, though, let's tell you about a chance to learn ultrasound, catch a buffalo, and hang out with slows while he teaches ultrasound while catching buffalo. Or buffaloes. Or is it buffalo or buffaloes? I think buffalo. I'm going to look that up. Have you ever been to Jackson Hole, Wyoming? Have you completely mastered the arts of airway management and bedside ultrasound? Well, if you want to check one or all of those boxes off, we've got the solution for you. Rich Levitan does his amazing airway course at Jackson Lake Lodge in Wyoming in June each year. Next year is going to be the week before SMAC, which is in Chicago, and Rich asked us to join him there. Now, we had already planned a different course, but Matt and I have both actually been to Jackson Lake Lodge before and taught an ultrasound course there. And it was amazing. It's one of the most beautiful places on Earth, nestled in the Tetons and 20 minutes from Yellowstone, personally my favorite national park. So come join us. What we're going to do is run both Rich's Airway course and our ultrasound course in a way that you can attend either or both while you're there. We're going to use the ULA content to flip a lot of the course so that it's nearly all hands-on and we can really focus on the skills more than the lecture part. It's truly an amazing place and we're going to give you an amazing education while you're there. And for you Aussies or other international folks who are coming to SMAC, this is right on your way. And it's a week before. It's an intermediate time zone to allow you to get used to U.S. time a little more gradually and also let you snag a little bit of awesome while you're over here. Speaking of awesome, that reminds me, if you haven't signed up for SMAC, do that now. It's going to be off the hook. Mike and I were both there last year and we'll be there this year. And it's the most phenomenal critical care course ever. Smack.net.au to register for SMAC and YellowstoneUltrasound.com to register for the ultrasound course. Holy cow! Ultrasound in Yellowstone! Yes, it's uh, definitely buffalo. Andy, some have called you the pediatric potentate, master of all things pertaining to the ultrasound of little adults. I've heard you teach interception ultrasound at Castle Fest last year, and it was phenomenal. So I wanted to get your input. Russ did a fantastic job. Do you have any other pearls you want to add or important points he made that you want to stress? All right, Matt and Mike, first of all, a big thanks for having me on the Ultrasound Podcast to make some comments about interception. I go in to check in. They ask the most insulting question when you check into a hospital. What seems to be the problem? What seems? Well, it seems. It seems like everything on my inside wants to be on my outside. But I'm no doctor. Okay, intussusception is really a lot like what Brian Reagan was talking about when he was checking into the ER, except everything on the outside is trying to get on the inside. The ilium is trying to get inside the colon, and those kids feel like crap. So the thing I would tell you is it's not just the textbook kid that is colicky and curling up their legs. It is also the kid that is just laying there lethargic. This is the time to use the L word. If you see a kid that's just laying around, you got to think that that kid might have intussusception. Dr. Stokes, I concur. Seriously, this is an important point. I vividly remember my first ever case of intussusception at the children's hospital where I did shifts in residency. I was convinced the little bugger had meningitis. He was so lethargic. So now, when I see a lethargic kid that fits the age range and has any other symptoms at all of intussusception, it's one of the first things I think of. All right, comment numero uno. Russ did a fantastic job. Great job with that intussusception lecture. I guess I would add a couple of things. One, I absolutely agree. The way I scan for intussusception is very similar to how I scan for appendicitis. Start at the bladder, move out to the iliacs. We can all find those. Adult central lines, got to find the iliacs to put in a central line so you know exactly where those are. And then if you know where that is, you can find the psoas and find the cecum. Let me stop and ask you something. Are you not all ER doctors? Is not 90 to nearly 100% of your job sniffing out crap? Well, that's what you're doing. You are finding a big load of crap, and that's going to be in the cecum. Might be water. 
Might be watery stool, but crap is going to be there. You're going to see the air. You're going to see the fluid. You're going to see the stool to let you know where you are. And then all I have to ask is, can you draw three lines? If you can draw three lines, you can find the path that the poop takes out the rectum. And that's what you're going to do. Exactly what Russ told you to do. You're going to scan up the ascending colon to the liver, then across the transverse colon to the spleen, and then down the descending colon until you find the sigmoid. And you're going to follow that trail of poop all the time looking for something that looks like a target. It may look like a pseudokidney, and we should talk about that. When the intussusception happens, the bowel gets wrapped up and it takes the mesentery with it and pulls those vessels in. And that's what gives it the renal pyramid, the renal pelvis appearance is those vessels getting pulled up inside of the mesentery and twisted around. It could also look like pancakes. And that's why I say don't limit your scan just to up and down in three lines. Once you do the three lines, Go back and scan back and forth in the longitudinal and transverse plane. Look for pancakes. Look for target. But stay on top of that colon. Your colon, your poop shoot, that's your marker. You got to stay with that and you will find into susception. Now, a little bit of caution. We don't like to throw caution to the wind. Remember, a sensitivity of 85%, that's a 1 in 5, 1 in 6 false negative rate. We do not like that kind of false negative rate in the emergency department. You can't take it. The specificity is very good, so use it for the specificity. If you see it, call the surgeon, call the transfer, get the patient underway. You don't need to sit on them. But if you do not see it, please, 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 and twice on Sunday, please again, do not write that patient off and send them home. Get radiology to do the confirmatory test. You need to know if you thought there was a high pretest probability, machines are getting really, really good, really good, but they are not quite at the level of what the radiologist has. So do not drop that sensitivity ball. If you see it, specificity, great. Very, very few false positives. Lee Chen article, fantastic. Everyone likes to quote that article, and it's great because he was teaching people without any experience how to do this study, and they were picking it up. If you see it, it is probably there, but if you do not, it may still be there. So go ahead and get the radiologist, load the boat, and have them check it out for you. Now, a couple of other quick points. One, if you see a patient on a board-style exam with red dots all over their butt, they probably have HSP, and they probably want you to pick into susception. Go ahead and call radiology, the surgeon, whatever the appropriate answer is on the test. Secondly, I would caution you from calling small bowel, small bowel into susceptions. You can measure them. They're less than two centimeters. Fantastic. But I would have radiology confirm that test. That limb is way too thin and way too shaky for me to recommend that you go out on. Definitely, if you see something that looks like intussusception, just have the radiologist confirm which one it is. There is no need to take all that responsibility yourself with this generation of of point-of-care ultrasound machine. And lastly, God bless radiologists. I love them. I try to go hang with them as much as I can in the ER. Our ER-trained radiologists are awesome. And you go over there and they teach you so much stuff. But some of the pediatric radiologists out there still want you to order x-rays for this disease. Why would you radiate a child when you have a modality, i.e. ultrasound, that is so good and the sensitivity and specificity of x-rays is so poor? When they start talking about how that helps them increase their sensitivity and specificity, go ahead and ask them to pull the articles. Because I can tell you, my friends, they are not there, not in the degree that they would have you believe. They do not increase their sensitivity and specificity to the point that you should be ordering those x-rays. That is my opinion. It would be better to put those kids on the floor and continue the exams than needlessly radiate them. So please, 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 if at all possible, Go ahead and transfer them to the big center. We will try everything we can to avoid radiating those patients. Andy, I'll ask you the same question I asked Russ now. Why? Here at UK, we've got 24-7 sonographers. We can order this test and get it done pretty quickly. So even if we don't get it done as quickly as doing it ourselves, it would still be less total time for us while we see other patients or catch up on doodle jump. So how would we convince a resident that this is important enough to learn? Is it only important for them to learn in case they ever practice somewhere without ultrasound? That's probably enough of a reason, but are there other reasons? How is that an apostrophe? I think you mean an epiphany. 
lightning has just struck my brain. Well, that must hurt. So I had an epiphany a long, long time ago, and it happened around the first time I put an ultrasound probe in my hand. Why would I feel something? Why would I try to touch something that I can see? And that is exactly what Russ was saying. I want to narrow the differential diagnosis every time I see a pediatric patient. Those that know me will say that that guy takes the ultrasound probe, sometimes a rectal kit and an LP, into every patient's room that he meets. And that's because I want the ability to look inside. I don't want to guess. So I put the ultrasound probe on and ding, 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 constipation. I put the ultrasound probe on and, ooh, I wasn't expecting that, appendicitis. Or I put the ultrasound probe on and it has happened a couple of times where I just go in to give the parents a laser light show and I'm like, what? Huh? Into susception? I would have never guessed that. At least twice in the last 10 years that's happened to me. So why would you guess? What are 50% of the pediatric patients you're going to see on your next shift complaining of? Belly pain. What are the other 50%? Respiratory. So half of your patients are going to be belly pain. Why would you want to handicap yourself? I want to know if it's constipation. I want to know if it's intussusception. I want to know if it's appendicitis. If I get it right out of the gate, if the specificity is that good that I can see it when I put the probe on, I'm heading in the right direction. If I'm out in the community center, I'm transferring the patient. If I really didn't think it all along, yes, I may put the ultrasound probe on just to show the parents everything's okay. But really, I'm like, okay, the kid's just constipated. I need to unload some bowels. And the other big reason, yes, of course, Matt, we have ultrasound 24-7 at the big center. But why do I want to wait on that? Do I want to wait on the sonographer? I'm seeing four abdominal pain patients an hour in the pediatric section of the big hospital. No, I don't want to wait on that. I want to know right out of the gate. And when I was in the community... I wanted to know who am I going to transfer and who am I going to keep, and no offense, but who do I get to go ahead and bill and send home? One of the major goals in the community is to move really fast. This modality will help you move fast, at least faster, so give it a shot. Get FASA with it. It will increase your speed. And lastly, I want to stop radiology. I'm on a mission to stop radiology from radiating patients. I'm on a mission to stop anyone from radiating pediatric patients. The resident who wants to order a KUB, they have to really justify that to me. Why are we getting a KUB? What is the sensitivity and specificity of that? Intussusception? Eh, bad. Constipation? Eh, bad. What's the sensitivity and specificity of ultrasound? Ooh, pretty good. Confirming what I already knew when I started in with my clinical exam in my history. It is the best confirmatory test we have that gives no extra radiation. How can you not want to use that? Want to use that? Brilliant, Andy. Great stuff. We truly appreciate you taking the time. However, I would like to add a last little rant about how you use ultrasound. Andy basically uses it as an extension of the physical exam, which I know we're not supposed to say. It's definitely a separate, distinct procedure. But I'm kind of sick of the semantics. And yes, I get it. I understand. But I also want to be honest here. It's how a lot of us use this tool because it just makes sense. If we get real about the physical exam and how much exactly pushing on the abdomen or auscultating the heart adds to our ability to make the diagnosis compared to our actually looking with ultrasound, a tool that has no radiation or harm associated with it, then I think we all have this epiphany at some point. Especially with the new handheld machines that simply don't slow us down anymore by having to push anything around. But there's a big but here. We all know the possible cost and harm associated with doing a test that may seem like a free lunch on a patient with such a low pretest probability that the likelihood of us finding a true positive is less than the likelihood of us finding a false positive. The cost is more testing, possibly more treatment, and possibly harm to the patient. And even if it's not truly a false positive, we have things like pneumonia, pneumothorax, and pleural effusions. The ultrasound is more sensitive than x-ray at diagnosing. So if we identify that small effusion that we would have not found on x-ray, what do we do with that? Do we do more testing? Do we drain it as further workup? There could be harm associated with that in the patient where in all likelihood we would have never noticed it and they would have been fine in the past. Just like our over-treatment of tiny peas now due to newer generation CT scanners picking up tiny subsegmental ones that probably would have been fine. But now we put a patient on Coumadin and they fall and die from a head bleed. It's very possible that we've gotten so good with ultrasound and it's such a powerful tool, even in the hands of novices, that our diagnostic abilities have outpaced our ability to really know what to do with all the diagnoses we're picking up. Of course, do we bury our heads in the sand and say we don't want to know what about these diagnoses? Maybe. 
Probably not, though. Overdiagnosis is clearly a problem, but it's really only a problem if the overdiagnosis leads to overtesting and overtreating of real pathology that's clinically insignificant. The answer is probably just more education. The goal would be to get everyone to the point Andy probably is. Andy's a fantastic clinician who reads voraciously, has great experience, and weighs the decisions about what to do next after his ultrasound of every patient where he starts turning things up. We're not all there, though, so this is an important discussion to have. What we don't want is to lock up the machine until you've reached a certain point. Then you'll never learn how to scan. We also know there has to be some level of knowledge that comes along with the ability to make a diagnosis with ultrasound. The goal isn't to make diagnoses. The goal is to benefit our patients. I certainly don't have all the answers, but people much smarter than me are discussing this. In fact, in a podcast coming up very soon, we discuss a paper that has brought these issues to the forefront. We'll discuss it with Vicki Noble, Mike Stone, and Christian Larson, the author of the paper. It was published in The Lancet and shows incredibly increased diagnostic accuracy as related to respiratory diagnoses specifically, but not really a patient benefit. If you don't know the paper, you should read it. It was titled, point-of-care ultrasonography in patients admitted with respiratory symptoms, a single-blind, randomized control trial. Look it up and read it if you haven't, and be ready for the discussion coming up soon. If you're not good enough at ultrasound, that's not an excuse to punish your patients with radiation. Get out there, ultrasounds, hearts, lungs, my VCs, let us know how you feel about it.